Okay, so hello and welcome to everyone joining us for today's webinar. My name is Laura Dean. I'm content writer, currently in the Limassol office. I studied my LLB at Brighton in the UK. And um, today I'll be covering a range of basic principles about the roles and responsibilities within a company, touching briefly on uh, shareholders, company secretary, but mainly focusing on the directors of a company. So I'd like to draw your attention to the chat box on screen. If something is unclear or you would like further clarification on anything mentioned today, please feel free to submit your questions and I'll be happy to elaborate in the form of Q&A section at the end, time permitting of course, and any unanswered questions via email. So if you'd like more information about any judgment or ruling, looking at case law will give you a really in-depth overview. So I've put the cases in bold throughout the presentation and I'd recommend taking a note of them to look up later if you'd like. Okay, so uh, we'll discuss shareholders and other company officers, uh, appointment responsibilities within an organization. Uh, we'll mainly be discussing the roles of directors, their appointments, annual general meeting, responsibilities of the board of directors, dividend distribution, ultravires, and the repercussions for acting outside of their duties, as well as the role of company secretaries, common misconceptions associated with this name, and their powers and potential liability. Okay, so we'll discuss shareholders now. A shareholder or stockholder is an individual or institution that legally owns a share of stock in a public or private corporation. Shareholders are the owners of a limited company. They buy shares which represent part ownership of a company and they have the potential to profit if the company does well, but that also comes with the potential to lose if the company does poorly. So the roles of shareholders, they conduct major decisions which would have an effect on shareholders' rights. Uh, they're usually required by the Companies Act 2006 to be improved by the shareholders at a general meeting called by the directors of the company. So uh, general meetings, uh, they fulfill the role of being a shareholder. A shareholder may require a general meeting to be called rather than simply have all the decisions made through written resolutions. The directors of a company will in fact call a general meeting despite not being able to vote at the meeting. Uh, this is solely for the shareholders. So the duties of shareholders is to pass uh, resolutions at a general shareholder meeting by voting through their shareholder capacity. This duty is particularly important as it allows shareholders to exercise ultimate control over the company and how it is managed. Shareholders can vote in one of two ways, via a show of hands or through a poll vote, where each vote will be proportionate to the amount of shares held by each shareholder. So um, section 324 of the Companies Act 2006 governs the right to appoint proxies and this means that a member of a company is entitled to appoint another person as his proxy to exercise all or any of his rights to attend and as well to speak and vote on his behalf at any meetings of the company. Okay, so officers of the company. Officers are responsible for the management and day-to-day -day operations of the corporation. They are appointed by the board of directors. Each state's corporation will each state's corporation statute will specific will specify the other officer positions that may be filled by each corporation. Executive officers have the authority to legally bind the corporation and they're not personally liable for their acts as long as they're acting lawfully on behalf of the corporation. So they have a number of rights such as um, to disqualify directors, um, to call meetings, to appoint and remove directors by a you know, show of hands. As well as various 
procedures and other matters relating to the distribution of dividends to shareholders. Um, so appointing a managing director, delegating powers to a committee of directors, to appoint the secretaries and other directors, as well as the use of company seal. So we'll look at uh, distributions now. So uh, UK company law is mostly concerned with when a distribution may be made than when a dividend may be declared. Dividends arise as a consequence of a process of internal company governance and company law simply gives a model for the corporate constitutional relationship. So profits available for distribution. At common law, there is a basic principle that dividends or distributions must not be paid out of a capital, even if the articles of a company authorize such payment. So this is exemplified in the case Re-Exchange Banking Limited, Phil Croft's case. It's a leading case associated with statutory code of profits in the legal sense, appears in regulations made under the Companies Act. An example is large or medium-sized companies and groups regulated. Uh, this is made under section 396. In general, the rules do not distinguish between capital and revenue profits, but rather concentrate on the differences between realized and unrealized profits according to accountancy principles. So all calculations for profits available for distribution must be taken from relevant accounts. However, not everything is recognized uh, in accounts. So notably, where accounts are prepared under the IFRS, International Financial Reporting Standards, is an example of a gain on the revaluation of an investment property. See the Companies Act 2006 largely, largely replaced the previous common law. Uh, so the overriding principles is now that a dividend or a distribution to shareholders may only be made out of profits available for the purpose, and that's under section 830. So they changed regarding the requirements for keeping of accounts, any audit requirements, procedures dealing with how notices should be served by the company upon shareholders, as well as exclusions and exemptions of liability clauses, as well as indemnification. Okay, so uh, the doctrine of capital maintenance means that a company must receive proper consideration for shares that it issues, and that having received such capital, it must not repay it to members except in certain circumstances. This is a fundamental principle of English company law. So the Companies Act 2006 makes a number of important changes to the rules relating to capital maintenance and as well in line with deregulatory objectives of the Act and a number of statutory requirements in this regard have been relaxed such as um, the shareholders must pay for shares in full, uh, dividends must be paid out from profit only, uh, as well as companies being prohibited from issuing shares at a discounted rate for less than par value. So a flaw of the capital maintenance doctrine is that it can prevent the distribution of capital to shareholders, however, not to creditors. So corporate governance broadly refers to the mechanisms, processes and relations by which corporations are controlled and directed. Governance structures and principles identify the distribution of rights and responsibilities among different participants in the corporation, such as the board of directors, managers or shareholders. So um, traditional corporate model and corporate governance presumes a distinct separation in between ownership, um, such as the power of running a company, um, so expertise, capital, continuity, as well as liability. So uh, shareholders enjoy limited liability, which means that no personal assets can be used for repayment.
Okay, so we'll talk about directors now of a company. So a company's articles of association, or called articles of incorporation in some jurisdictions, is essentially a document which, along with the memorandum of association, in cases where the memorandum exists, form the company's constitution, defines the responsibilities of the directors, the kind of business to be undertaken, and the means by which the shareholders exert control over the board of directors. Company is an incorporated body, so there should be rules and regulations formed for the management of its internal affairs and conduct of its business, as well as the relation between members and the company. Moreover, the rights and duties of its members and the company must be recorded. This is why the Articles of Association are necessary. So the Articles of Association, it's a document. Um, it's really important and it definitely needs to be filed with the registrar of companies or uh, the company's house depending on the jurisdiction of the company and so the case the Quinn and Axton's Limited versus Salmon uh, this was set up as a business of drafters furnishing and general warehousemen in Brixton London William Axton's was the chairman of the company and Joseph Salmon with another man, Arthur Way, were the managing directors. The Axons and Salmon held the majority of the shares, and the constitution stated that no resolution would be effective if either Axons or Salmons disputed it. The directors were allowed otherwise to uh, manage the company as they wished. So Axons wanted to buy and let some property, however, Salmon disagreed. So an extraordinary general meeting was held where the same resolution was passed by a majority of shareholders which effectively overrode the director's wishes, i.e. salmon. Okay, so we'll talk about the appointment of directors now. The initial founding directors of a firm are appointed by the original investors. Uh, they're also referred to as members or subscribers, and usually from among themselves are named in the Articles of Association. However, the mere mention in the Articles does not constitute a valid appointment until the person gives his or her signed consent to hold the office of director and as long as they're not disqualified for any reason from that office. The so appointment or election of the subsequent directors is usually effected at a general meeting by resolution to the effect. But the existing directors often have the power to fill vacancies on the board of directors at any time, subject to confirmation later at general meeting. So, as they can, as directors can be appointed, they can also be removed. Um, they can retire as well. So, removal of a public company director is governed by Section 152 of the Companies Act. And it's good to note here that, as a general rule, unless there is a such legislative provision or provision in the Articles of Association of the company, the company has no inherent power to remove a director prior to the expiration of his office. So you can be banned or disqualified from being a company director if you don't meet your legal responsibilities, of course. So anyone in the company can report a director's conduct as being unfit. Uh, this includes allowing a company to continue trading when it can't repay its debts, not keeping a proper company accounting records, not sending accounts or returns to the company's house, not paying any tax owed by the company, or not using company money or assets for his personal benefit. A director may resign voluntarily on his own accord, even if the Articles of Association are silent on the matter. In the case Knight and Bullock, the court held that even if the Articles of Association had required the directors to resign by letter in writing, the fact of an oral resignation made to the company secretary or other company officers was held to be significant, sorry, sufficient resignation. 
Usually, it's best practice to ensure that a provision is included in the Articles of Association for such resignation left to be accepted by either the board or at least the company secretary. So, in other words, the mere giving of notice uh, may be insufficient. So, as well, even with protection clauses, director may be legitimately removed from office in the event of the following actions. Uh, the director has been declared bankrupt, has developed an unsound mind, or following the following an absence of over six months without prior approval from other directors. The directors can also be removed with automatic effect in the event of being convicted of an offence, imprisonment, a decision made by a majority vote from the board of directors to vacate the office or a disqualification ruling from the court. The director rights. Uh, obviously, directors do have rights and protections here. So if a director feels he has been unfairly removed, he may sue for compensation or damages for breach of contract of service. The office of such directors can be vacated if the Articles of Association provide accordingly. Where the Articles of Association are silent as to the removal of a director of company, and the previous points we discussed have not taken place, then such director cannot be removed. However, given that the Articles of Association is only a contract between the shareholders and the company, uh, the articles may be amended by following the requisite procedure and then consequently removing the director. So the directors of a firm are vested with certain powers by the corporate legislation and the firm's articles of association. These generally include the power to act as the firm's agent, have full access to firm's accounts, cause the firm to enter into valid contracts, pledge the firm's assets, borrow and give security, determine terms and conditions under which the firm's shares are issued, transferred or forfeited as well. So this includes allotment and issuance of shares in exchange for cash paid by shareholders, to borrow money, to make calls on unpaid shares, or to convene general meetings between company shareholders and director meetings as well. So, as well as managing general affairs of a company, directors mainly uh, buying and sell goods for services for the benefit of the company. They deal with workforce maintenance, hiring and firing employees where required, appointing company agents and officers, opening and maintaining bank accounts or other accounts, and entering into contracts or other deals effectively binding the company. So we'll talk about uh, responsibilities of the directors a little bit more here. So they look after the affairs of the company and essentially are in a position of trust. They may abuse their position in order to profit at their expense of the company and therefore at the expense of shareholders of the company. So consequently, the law imposes a number of duties, burdens, and responsibilities upon directors to prevent such abuse. Much company law legislation can be seen as a balance between allowing directors to manage the company's business so as to make a profit, but as well preventing them from abusing this freedom. Directors are responsible for ensuring that proper books of accounts are kept, and in some circumstances, a director can be required to help repay the debts of the company, even though it is a separate legal entity. So, for example, directors of a company who try to trade out of difficulty and fail, they may be found guilty of wrongful trading and can be made personally liable. Directors are particularly vulnerable. If they have acted in a way which may benefit themselves, um, they will be seen as personally liable if any loss is caused to the company because of any illegal or ultra-vires act. Um, but we will discuss ultra -vires in more depth a little bit later on. And it's important to note that obviously uh, the position of a director, they're in great power in any company, so that's generally why decisions are made by the board of directors as a whole.
Okay, so directors have a fiduciary duty, and that means to act in good faith of the company's expense. Uh, so we'll discuss the main elements of the duty to act in good faith. The traditional formulation requires directors to act bona fide for the benefit of the company as a whole. So in its application to directors, inquiry is directed to the intention, their motives and beliefs, or whether they have made interest of the company as their principal consideration before acting. So therefore, directors can abuse their discretionary powers if they use them in order to achieve an advantage for themselves or to confer a benefit upon a third party um, shareholder or class of shareholders or stranger to a company or um, which causes damage to itself ultimately. So the modern duty comprises three distinct, independent, but inter interrelated duties applicable to directors when acting as such and exercising corporate power. Each duty sustains an independent ground for judicial review and intervention in director's decisions, so only one of these needs to be satisfied. So it's subjective good faith, proper purpose, consult and act in reference to company interests, and uh, this was found in Aberdeen Railway and Blakey. So the Blakey brothers had a contract with Aberdeen Railway to make iron chairs, uh, which they sued to enforce this contract. Uh, Aberdeen Railway argued that they were not bound because at the time, the chairman of their board of directors, Sir Thomas Blakey, was the managing director of Blakey brothers, and therefore there was a conflict of interest. This case preceded section 40 of the Companies Act 2006, which give directors unlimited capacity to bind the company with those dealing in good faith. However, if an action by a director is beyond their authority or in breach of some fiduciary obligation, then they may be made personally liable. Arguably, therefore, Blakey Brothers would now have been able to enforce the contract. However, Aberdeen could then personally sue the directors for damaging for damages resulting from any loss made by them. And this was reinforced by Hunter Kane and Watkins case. This is a, a good case to look at for the summation of the, the director's fiduciary duties. So the duty to exercise powers for proper purpose. Directors must exercise their corporate powers for the purposes which they were granted by the position of director. This permits the court to invalidate decisions taken by directors where the motivating purpose is one which a court permits it as beyond those for which the particular power may be legitimately exercised or if not to benefit the company generally you know, as we discussed uh, previously. So some applications of the duty of good faith do not distinguish between the good faith and purpose elements as independent heads of duty. However, invoke each as synonymous an expression of single and underlying equitable obligation. So the power must be exercised bona fide. So that's for the purpose for which it was conferred or um, the absolute will of the directors, but honestly, in the interest of the shareholders and company as a whole. The need to distinguish between good faith and proper purposes requirement becomes important, where the power in question is capable of more objective characterization. So we'll look at the case Howard Smith Limited and Ample. So this is concerned with the power of directors to issue new shares. It was alleged that the directors had issued a large number of new shares purely to deprive a particular shareholder out of his voting majority. And the court rejected this um, argument that the power to issue shares could only be properly exercised to raise new capital um, as it was too narrow and they held it would be a proper exercise of directors powers to issue shares to a larger company to ensure the financial stability of the company or as part of an agreement to exploit mineral rights owned by the company. So if this is the case, um, an incidental result that the shareholder lost his majority 
or a takeover bid was defeated, it would not itself make the share issue inadequate. But if the sole purpose was to rescind a voting majority or block a takeover bid, as in this case, um, this is a common example of what would constitute improper pur purpose. So under modern company law legislation, there are appropriate statutory requirements to regulate direct powers, typically used in, in conjunction with um, companies' articles of association. So if a director fails to disclose an interest or fails to obtain the company's approval, the transactions may be set aside and any profit from the transaction must be awarded to the company. Uh, so now we will discuss the use of corporate property, opportunity or information. Directors must not, without the informed consent of the company, use their own profit for company assets, opportunities or information. And this regulation is much less flexible than the prohibition against the transactions with the company or attempts to circumvent it using provisions in the articles which have been met with a limited success. So an example of this is in Regal, Hastings, Limited and Gulliver. The House of Lords upheld what was regarded as an unfounded claim by the shareholders. Um, so in this case, even though the actions the directors took related to the affairs of the company, it can probably be said to have been done in the course of their management and in the utilization of their opportunities and special knowledge of directors. What they ultimately resulted in um, profits to themselves. So accordingly, the directors were required to expel the profits that were made and the shareholders received their payout in full. Um, so this decision has been followed in several subsequent cases and is now regarded as settled legislation and precedent here. Uh, so this case is an example of when um, this is an unfounded shareholder claim against the directors. Okay, so uh, directors' duties, skills, and duty of care. Uh, traditionally, the level of care and skill directors must demonstrate has been framed largely with reference to uh, a non-executive director. and um, this is exemplified in the case Re City Equitable Fire Insurance Company, uh, which we will look at the details of in just a minute. So it was expressed in purely subjective terms, where the court held that a director need not exhibit in the performance of his duties a greater degree of skill than may be reasonably expected from a person of his knowledge or experience. However, a more modern approach has since been developed and in Dorchester Finance Co. Limited and Stebbing, the court held that the rule in the equitable buyer case related only to skill and not to diligence. So with respect to diligence, what was required was such care as an ordinary man might be expected to take on his own behalf. Um, this was a dual subjective and objective test. Uh, so we'll now look at the leading case law surrounding common law position of duty and care in uh, Re-City Equitable Fire Insurance Company. So this company lost over a million pounds um, in failure of investments and large-scale fraud of the chairman. Um, the chairman's name was Gerard Lee Bevan. Um, the liquidator sued the other director negligence. The auditors, however, the Court of Appeal held that they were honest and exonerated provisions in the company's article. It was held that some of the directors did breach the duty of care. However, they were not liable to reimburse because an exclusion clause for negligence was valid. In Dorchester Finance Co. Limited and Stebbing, um, this is a UK company law case under Wrongful Trading Provisions Act of um, Insolvency, so that's 1986, Section 240. And uh, this case, in connection with the, the Act as well, noted that the director of the company must act 
in good faith and in interest of the company. He must display such skills as may reasonably be expected of a person with his knowledge and experience, which at all times must be taken um, such care as a prudent man would take on his own behalf. Um, and Theodore Goddard reinforcing previous two cases. So directors must carry out their functions with sufficient care and competence. And um, the Norman and Theodore Goddard laid out a two-part test which uh, lays down the standard of care expected of directors. So this is objective and subjective. So the objective test uh, that is required of a reasonable director carrying out particular functions that they're responsible for by the experience, skill and knowledge that an individual director has. Um, so they, if they've fallen below a certain standard in their conduct, for instance, and if the director has higher standard of knowledge, experience and skill, then that's expected under the first part of the test, then they will be judged on whether they have reached the standard expected in the second subjective part of the test. So for example, a director who has a long period of service will be expected to perform a higher standard than a newly appointed director. So it has been suggested that both of the tests uh, using skill and diligence should be assessed. And um, in the UK, the statutory provisions relating to directors' duties have been codified on this basis of using the Companies Act 2006. Uh, this is the modern common law legislation which holds that a subjective test alone is not sufficient. So this applies to legislation as per Section 122 of British Virgin Islands, Business Companies Act 2004. The director of a company must act in good faith and in the interest of the company must display such skill as a reasonably effective person with his knowledge and experience and must at all times take care as a prudent man would on his own behalf. Taking into account the nature of the company, um, decisions of the company and his position as director as well. So in Dorchester Finance Company and Seven, this is an, a landmark company law case used in conjunction with the wrongful trading provisions of the Insolvency Act 1986. Uh, this is an example of how um, the objective and subjective facts uh, must both be looked at when uh, seeing whether direct actions were actually unlawful. So um, in this case, this is the company uh, Dorchester Finance, it had gone insolvent and it made a claim against Mr. Stebbing and two other non-executive direct accountants with, um, they usually signed blank checks which were later counterfined by Mr. Stebbing. Uh, so it was held that directors of the company bound to act in good faith and in the interest of the company. Um, they also had to display such skill and care as should be reasonably expected. Um, so the system of signing blank checks was held obviously to be negligent and they were found to be liable for losses under section 214 of the Insolvency Act. Uh, Judge Foster in this case held further that it would not be appropriate for the court to exercise its discretion to relieve these directors on the basis that they acted honestly and reasonably under um, section 157 of the Companies Act. So in the Bishopsgate Investment Management and Maxwell case, um, Robert Maxwell, who controlled Maxwell Group PLC, um, he bought the Daily Mirror in 1984 and fell off his yacht in the Canary Islands in um, 1991 
um, it transpired that he'd used the company pension funds to fund his own extravagant lifestyle. So Mr. Maxwell was Robert's son and a director of the Bishopsgate Investment Management Limited, which was supposed to be safeguarding the company pension plans. So he'd signed a share transfer from Bishopsgate to the Maxwell Group PLC with no consideration. So the shares had been held on trust for a number of pension schemes and the liquidators of Bishopsgate sued Ian Maxwell uh, to compensate for the value of the shares on the basis that it was in proper use of the company's property. So in this case, Mr Maxwell was liable for the value of the shares, not even on the basis of, basis of any negligence, however, merely by misapplying the assets. Um, so we we will be discussing now um, just some common questions and answers uh, relating to director duties. Um, so whether a director is liable for failing to complete an application for insurance correctly before submission, giving an insurance company grounds to reject a claim. So um, most likely, yes, he would be director would probably be found negligent for failing to review or understand the form fully. Uh, this is because director is in breach of duty and becomes liable to compensate the company for any loss, um, as in the um, Bishopsgate investment management case. Can the director be accountable for liable uh, for breach of duty for relying on information given to him by other staff or agents of the company. Um, so usually it, uh, the answer is no. It's probably not, um, provided that the director has no grounds to suspect that the information is incorrect. is a direct liable for loss if you proposed the diversification but the new venture was kind of a disaster and the company suffered big losses and um, probably not so provided that the director applied his mind in an informed manner he cannot be held liable if his decision turns out to be a bad one So, uh, director duties, we talk about nominee directors now. So, a nominee director is a person who acts as a non executive director on the board of directors of a firm on behalf of another person or firm, such as bank, investor, or lender. Also, a resident in the tax haven who lends his or her name to a non resident as a trustee on the board of an offshore firm in that haven. So typically there is no shareholding requirement for the nominee director. However, if the legislation of a firm impose share qualification, um, the nominee director must obtain them within a specific period. Um, some jurisdictions allow a firm to be named as nominee, nominee director of another firm as well, without it being um, seen as a conflict of interest. claims by the company. The company itself can bring a claim against the director if it can show that he has suffered some loss, the company has suffered loss because of um, the director's actions. So if the director has made some personal profit, um, they can be uh, required to surrender that gain to the company. Um, the company may also seek an injunction to stop the director from carrying out or continuing with the breach. Uh, damages in the way of compensation where a director has been negligent, a restoration of the company's property, or rescinding the contract in which the director has an undisclosed interest or profit to the company. Okay, so the case, um, this is the proper plaintiff rule in Foss and Harbottle. Um, this is a, a corporate law case 
whereby any action in which a wrong is alleged to have been done to a company, the proper claimant is the company itself, uh, which is known as the rule in Foss and Harbottle. I would recommend taking a note of this case if you want to do some further reading around the subject. Um, it has made light of several important exceptions that have been developed um, and are often described as exceptions to the rule in Foss and Harbottle. So amongst these is derivative action, which allows minority shareholders to bring a claim on behalf of the company. Uh, so this applies in situations of wrongdoer control and in reality it's the only true exception to the rule. Um, this is a good starting point for um, minority shareholder remedies. To shareholder claims, the director owes their duties directly to the company and only the company can complain of any breach. Shareholders have no right to claim against the director for any loss they believe may have suffered as a result of this breach of duty. However much their shares have dropped in price, they cannot recover that loss of value from the directors they are responsible. So the old company law position was based on the principle of the majority rule um, laid down in the Foss and Harbottle case. So this rule stands for the proposition that the decisions and choices of the majority will always prevail over those of the minorities. Essentially, the greater amount of shareholding of an individual member, the greater rights or powers accrued to that individual member within the company may also apply. Um, so therefore it appears that a substantial amount of power has been placed in the hands of the majority shareholders and that by virtue of the majority rule, the minority shareholders are required to accept the decisions made by the majority shareholders. In such circumstances, the minority shareholder cannot ask the court for intervention because traditionally the Foss and Harbottle rule does not cater for minority members who protest an action of the company um, provided that the minority shareholders don't wish to um, take any action against this. So, however, a strict application of this rule would leave minority shareholders with no remedy when minority shareholders were acting illegally or oppressively against them. Um, so, as a result, several exceptions were developed. Um, as we discussed earlier, these exceptions to the rule in um, Foss and Harbottle. Um, so, in Pavleeds and Jensen, um, this case is an example of when minority shareholders were not allowed to overrule the majority. So, it was alleged that directors had been guilty of gross negligence in selling a valuable asset of the company at a price greatly below its true market value. So, this was stated that since the sale of the asset in question was not beyond the powers of the company, and since there was no allegation of fraud on the part of the directors um, by the majority shareholders, therefore the action did not fall within the admitted exceptions to the rule in Foss and Harbottle. So it was held that a minority shareholders action was not available since it was open to the company on the resolution of the majority of the shareholders to sell the mine at the price decided by the company in that matter. So additionally, it was open to the company on the resolution of the majority um, of the shareholders to uh, commence legal proceedings against the directors on the basis of negligence or error in judgment, so uh, selling the assets um, at an undervalue. So in this case, the court held that the directors were merely gross negligent in exercising their duties when they had not benefited from that negligence, it didn't um, amount to fraud in that instance. So there are a number of defences and safeguards available to, do, to directors. So where there is proof of prior approval of direct actions at a board meeting, so any exculpatory provisions, so where there was evidence in favour of the directions as per the company's articles of association, as well as an indemnity ruling from the company's business owner, for example. Um, directors and 
officer's liability may be sought as insurance uh, payable to the directors and officers of a company um, for losses or advancement of defence costs. Uh, essentially, as long as the director can prove that his actions were bona fide, i.e. in the best interest of the company, he will have sufficient protection against any claims against him. So a director in breach of duty may also be relieved of any liability if they can convince the court that they acted honestly and reasonably in all circumstances. This may happen where a director acted in good faith, such as uh, on the advice of a solicitor or other professional, but where the advice proved to be wrong. So the directors need not wait for proceedings against them before seeking court protection. They may bring about their own action in court in order to exempt themselves from any liability that may arise. Uh, obviously, these um, like the protection against liability is limited. Um, so in the event of intentionally illegal acts, um, obviously they're not covered in such policies. So for example, where directors have acted dishonestly or, or exercised um, an ultra vires act, i.e. outside of their powers. So we'll talk now about um, ultra vires. Uh, so ultra vires, it's a Latin phrase meaning beyond the powers. So if an act requires legal authority and it is done with such authority, it is characterized in law as intra vires, so within the powers. And if it is done without such authority, ultra vires, um, it's therefore seen by the courts as an invalid act. So in relation to directors, if a transaction is entered into direct into by a director which is beyond his powers but within the powers of the company. Uh, these can be ratified by a resolution of its members. So the Royal British Bank and Turquoise is a case that set precedent regarding people transacting with companies that are entitled to assume that internal company rules must be complied with even if they're not. Um, this is called the indoor management rule or the rule in Turquoise's case. It's applicable in most, if not all, common law jurisdictions and it originally mitigated the harshness of constructive notice doctrine and in the UK it's now accompanied by the Companies Act 2016, uh, sections 39 to 41. So to this effect, the Companies Act 2006 has uh, served to provide at section 40, where a third party looks to deal with a company in good faith, the director's power to bind the company or permit others to do so is considered free of any restriction under the Constitution. to permit a particular transaction, so we are not expected to expect the institution direct So West and Lazard Brothers is an example of when the court may strike down an exclusion or indemnity clause declaring it unenforceable unless it is limited to negligence only. So in this case it was held that such a wide exclusion will be struck down and declared unenforceable as there is no exclusion from liabilities for fraudulent acts or omissions. So um, if the exclusion and indemnity clause is contained in the company management agreement, it must be brought to the attention of the business owner at the time the agreement is signed or otherwise the court may strike it down and declare the clause to be void and unenforceable.
also um, personal liabilities of directors. If there's been wrong, wrongful trading, if at some time beforehand a director knew or ought reasonably to have concluded, there was no reasonable prospect of avoiding the insolvent firm and um, as long as it didn't take every step to minimize the potential loss to the company's creditors. Um, the aim of these wrongful trading laws is to ensure directors of companies, if they're getting into financial trouble, um, who may otherwise try to trade out of trouble, stop and think carefully about whether they are being overly optimistic about the company prospects. So uh, this is also looked at in um, section 332 of the Companies Act, um, where it was held that any business of the company that has been carried out with the intent to defraud creditors, the court may, if he thinks proper to do so, declare that any persons who were knowingly party to the wrongful trading um, carry out the business in the manner aforementioned shall be personally responsible without any limitation of liability for all or any debts of the company. Okay, so in order to establish liability, the liquidator must demonstrate using civil burden of truth, i.e. Um, on the balance of probabilities, that the director continued trading the company beyond a point in time when they knew or ought to have ascertained that insolvent liquidation was inevitable. So when it becomes wrongful trading is when it should have been realized that the position of the creditors was likely to deteriorate from that position onward or the company would proceed into liquidation. And once the director realizes that his or her company is insolvent, one important thing for him to do is to seek immediate professional advice from a licensed insolvency practitioner and uh, all directors who continue as directors of a company trading while insolvent may face disqualification under the Company Directors Disqualification Act. Okay, so now we will look at the role of company secretary. So a company secretary is a senior level officer and a person who can represent the company before any judicial body in relation to a legal dispute or other legal litigation. Um, so it's not just referring to a mere clerk here. And um, this is exemplified in the Panorama Development Skillford Limited case. And um, this concerns the enforceability of obligations against a company. So um, Judge Salmon in this case said the secretary is chief administrative officer of the company, so he has, he has ostensible authority with administrative matters. Nothing is more natural than ordering cars so that it serves servants may go and meet foreign customers at airports. Nothing to my mind is more natural than that. The company should hire those cars through its secretary. It might not be so with matters of commercial management of the company, for example. However, contract for the sale or purchase of goods in which the company deals, um, but uh, that was not the um, matter in this case. So we'll look at the um, secretary duties now. So the duties of a secretary may extend to statutory duties, duty of ex disclosure, duty to exercise due care, skill, diligence, as well as a number of administrative duties. This is very similar to um, director of the company. However, um, it deals more with the, um, you know, the, the daily runnings of the business as in, as in the um, Panorama Developments case. So all changes must be appropriately noted and accurately reflected in the company registers and the registrar of companies. Uh, so any changes to the company secretary, a new appointment or retirement of the, um, of the company. And the secretary may be removed by directors without a cause. Uh, that's unlike um, directors of the company as well.
Hello, can you hear me now? <laughs> okay, great. Um, so we were discussing, I'll just uh, backtrack a little bit. So um, as with all liability, there is a number of exclusion clauses of company secretary. So as long as the actions were made with the best interests of the company in mind, um, such as no deliberate acts of default or um, acting in a non bona fide way can be accounted for, which um, this is laid down in R and weight case okay, there. So the registered agent must also ensure that the company complies with all statutory requirements. By default, the registered agent can be found criminally responsible under the BVI Act um, 2004. So failure to reappoint a registered agent may lead to the striking off of the company from the company register. And the registered agent must keep company registers and the memorandum and articles of association the total time of meetings and any resolutions passed for up to 10 years. So that concludes today's webinar. Thank you everyone so much for participating. Um, I really hope you found it useful and um, sorry about the little interruption from, from the sound there. Um, you can find the full recordings of today's webinar at eltona-global.com um, as well as submitting any questions to info at eltona-global.com um, or you can just leave them in the chat box on screen and I will reply um, sometime later on today. So thanks again for participating and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.